45 miles east of Tallinn, Marine Sergeant Derek Campbell and his rifle squad from the 26th MEU were in the fight of their lives. Though the Russian advance had been momentarily interrupted to the north along Highway E20, that was not the case just a few miles south. With the collapse of defences in the city of Rakver hours earlier, Russians were now pouring down Highway 5 in their attempt to seize the small town of Tapa, its critical railway hub, and Tapa Army Base, the largest in the country. Earlier, Campbell and a company of Marines had arrived in Tapa to delay the Russian advance and allow time for the last remaining Estonian military and NATO personnel, their families and whatever equipment could be taken, to evacuate west to Tallinn. Now, with Russian artillery crashing down around them as tanks and armoured vehicles poured out of the tree line a half mile away, Campbell and his squad let loose their deadly Javelin anti-tank missiles, sending enemy turrets flying and vehicles brewing in the open, vulnerable terrain. Simultaneously, indirect and air support fire tore into the advancing vehicles, obscuring the field in dust, fire and smoke. Yet soon, like apparitions, more vehicles appeared and closed in though much more hesitantly, giving the critical time needed for those at the Tapa army base to evacuate and for Campbell and his squad to safely withdraw. It had been a successful operation with surprisingly few casualties, yet the mood was bitter. As they bounced along the roads back toward Tallinn, an angry Marine vented to Campbell. If we'd had more javelins and rockets, he said, we could have held that ground indefinitely. Campbell agreed but with battles raging across the Baltics, having enough of anything was proving increasingly difficult, and it was only getting worse. Meanwhile, the Russian invasion pressed on. As the war in the Baltics raged into its fifth day, at the US Ramstein Air Base in Germany, General Erich Radek, head of US European Command, met with Deputy Head of Allied Command Operations, UK General Sir Frank Vrabe, and on a video feed, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, US General Alan Belomo. As a constant stream of heavy lift aircraft arrived and departed, turning Ramstein into the busiest airport on the planet, Radic had called the meeting to discuss his most pressing challenge, logistics. Though NATO's air defense network was adequately repressing long-range Russian missile attacks and thus allowing supplies to reach Riga and Tallinn, getting those supplies out to units on the front lines was proving painfully slow and treacherous. It's the last mile that's the problem, said Radic. Russian reconnaissance and attack drones were flooding the field by the thousands, overwhelming NATO's counter-drone systems and thus opening critical supply units to attack. The need to keep supply lines adequately distributed was slowing down the whole process and in turn forcing fighting units to fall back. We keep punching the Russians in the nose, said Radic. We need to be chopping them at the knees. What he and General Vray proposed was a large-scale attack on rail lines, key bridges and known military logistics centers inside Western Russia in order to interrupt or sever their resupply efforts. General Belomo understood it to be a significant escalation. It was one thing to hit targets far from the public eye as they had in the Arctic, or small individual unit targets as in Kaliningrad. It was another to hit infrastructure within Russian cities. Radic countered that an escalation was coming either way that if things did not change and quickly, his forces would soon be fighting from the streets of Tallinn and Riga. The Russians will shell those cities to powder, he added. Hours later, authorization for the strike was granted, and soon some 70 aircraft from across NATO took to the skies in what was being called Operation Amazon. What they faced was daunting. Between them and their 24 designated targets was a buzzing hive of enemy aircraft, combined with Russia's most advanced integrated air defense systems. Four initial waves of NATO aircraft led the attack, the first jamming enemy radar and communication, while the remaining fired volleys of air-to-air -air missiles, precision glide bombs, and high-speed anti-radiation missiles. The Russians soon detected that something was happening, 
but knowing exactly what, how many and where proved difficult while buried in a fog of electronic jamming. Combat aircraft were quickly vectored toward the threat, but being electronically near-sighted, the Russian fighters were unaware that dozens of air-to-air -air missiles were already heading their way, each guided to their targets by NATO early warning and control aircraft. One by one, the Russian fighters were either rendered into flaming debris or had narrowly escaped but driven out of the fight. Meanwhile, over a hundred Russian surface-to-air missiles leapt into the sky to swap down the incoming glide bombs. But in doing so, the radar sites became targets themselves for the anti-radiation missiles racing in at nearly four times the speed of sound. Above the Russian city of Kingisep, civilians watched and cheered with each aerial explosion as contrails crisscrossed the sky. But they soon grew quiet as the wave of NATO missiles overwhelmed the Russian defences and dove into their targets. Coordinating it all from over the Baltic Sea, a NATO E-7 wedge tail sent updated data to the final wave of attack aircraft, indicating in real time which Russian air defence systems were suppressed or destroyed. As one operator put it, we told them which doors we'd successfully kicked open. As NATO stealth aircraft entered the breach, a wave of precision strike missiles launched from Western Latvia streaked high overhead for targets deep inside Russia. To avoid confusion that the coming attack was nuclear, a flash message was sent in Germany to the Russian Ministry of Defense. It read simply, imminent strike on targets within Western Russia are conventional only. The message ended amusingly. Have a nice day. Racing in just south of Lake Pikva, F-35 pilots, Lieutenant Commander Sam Heaton and Lieutenant Commander Heather Cooper, identified as Archer 1 and 2, made for the rail hub and highway bridges in central Pieskov. Near Pieskov, recorded cockpit audio captured the events of Archer 1 and 2. One, rifle. Two, rifle. Peeper confirms 500 in the air. Tally, another SAM launch, same location. Two defending. One defending 500. Lieutenant Commander Heaton later described being both eminently focused and terrified during those final moments of the attack. In all, 21 of the 24 targets were struck, dropping bridges and severing highways and rail lines from the outskirts of St. Petersburg down to the Russian border with Belarus. One NATO aircraft, a Growler, was lost, its pilot and electronic warfare officer ejecting over the Gulf of Finland. Despite repeated attempts to locate and rescue the crew, neither would ever be found. After landing safely in Germany, Lieutenant Commander Cooper later remarked how that morning's breakfast was the best she had ever tasted, the sunrise the most beautiful she'd ever seen. She was thrilled to be alive. At Ramstein, General Radic celebrated the mission's success, but held his breath as he and NATO braced for Russia's reaction. They did not have to wait for long. In the next episode, Russia carries out an unprecedented attack in the US homeland that will shake the American public to their core. If you enjoy this series and would like to support it, please send me a YouTube thanks or go to my Flat Circle History Patreon site where you will get behind-the-scenes access, member-only content, or even have a character named after you. Plus, it will help out John, the guy who makes all these episodes possible. By himself. Alone. It's just him. Lastly, a shout out to Robert Wilkerson, callsign Skinner, a former Harrier pilot who offered me valuable insight and saved my bacon in finding an error I'd made in this episode. Thanks, Rob. And as always, please like, subscribe and share this video. And thanks for watching.